The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 you will hear a conversation between a psychiatrist in the medical centre of the college and a new student. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 4. Hello, sit down please. Thank you. Now. You are a new patient, aren't you? Y yes, that's right. OK, so I'd better get some basic details down first. Right, we'll start with your name. Martin Hansen. Do you spell that S-O-N or S-E-N? H-A-N-S-E-N. OK, and you're a first-year student? Yes, I am. Study in? Uh, electronics, actually. Ah, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. And your address? Uh, 2805 Hesperian Avenue, Hayward. 2805 and Hesperian. Yes, that's H-E-S-P-E-R-I-A-N. Hayward, H-A-Y-W-A-R-D. And your phone number? 734-246-55. 734-26455. No, you got the six and the four the wrong way round. It's 24655. Huh? Sorry, right. And, um, when were you born? Ah, uh, the 15th of June, 1986. Here in New Zealand? No, I was born in Sydney. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 5 to 10. Good. So, what's your problem? Well, frankly, I wonder whether it is a problem. I get the blues, and it lasts for quite a while. I don't know how to... Yes, we all feel sad or get the blues now and again. Generally, our sadness lessens in time, and with the support of friends. However... If the depression leads to difficulty in thinking and greatly disrupts your daily routine, it can be evidence of a psychiatric problem. What do you feel exactly? I always feel sad and worthless. I find it hard to fall asleep and wake up early in the morning. How long has it lasted? Nearly half a month. Do you feel fatigue or loss of energy? Or... You may have lost interest or pleasure in usual activities. Yes, sometimes. At first I thought I could overcome it by myself, but I failed, and then... I'm so glad that you came here. It seems that you are suffering mild depression from your symptoms. Depression? Yes, I feel depressed sometimes. But why would I... Depression may occur as a result of biochemical changes in the body. Alcohol, amphetamines, cocaine, and LSD can bring on depression. Those who have a family history of depression usually have a greater risk of depression. Sometimes the worrying changes in life can lead to depression. I see. I had a really bad breakup of a love relationship. It makes me feel hopeless. Do you think I need some treatment? Yes. Antidepressant medications are often used to treat depression, if it is serious. But I don't suggest them at first because of the side effects. I suggest psychotherapy, which can give you support and help you regain control. So do I need to come here every day? No, I will arrange counselling sessions for you, which will last 12 to 20 weeks. You come here once or twice each week. The psychotherapy is directed at helping you gain insight and understanding about events in your life, which may have contributed to your depression. With growing insight, you can often learn more effective ways of coping with your feelings and changing your behaviour. What can I do to take care of myself? Well, 
At first, you should do some physical exercises on a regular basis, at least three times a week. How is your food? Do you eat well? Yes, I think so. I eat at my homestay family. Good. Find a hobby or a positive recreational activity to participate in once or twice a week. I know it's difficult for you, though. When you feel it's hard to overcome the depression, come to the counselling session. Remember, ask for help if the load is too heavy to handle. Yes, I'll try. So, when will my counselling session begin? I'm going to arrange that for you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. Listen to the conversation between two students, John and Carol. They have a list of the names of authors whose books have been given to the library. They have to classify the authors as writers of cookery, sports, or travel books. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. This is a great collection of books, isn't it? Very impressive. Who gave them to us? Apparently the donor was a book reviewer. There are a lot of books about sport. Here's one. My Life in Cricket. Well, that's certainly sports. Who's the author? Peter Adams. He also wrote Journeys Through Spain. Did he? Peter Adams writes books on both sports and travel, so S-T is written against his name. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 8. This is a great collection of books, isn't it? Very impressive. Who gave them to us? Apparently the donor was a book reviewer. There are a lot of books about sport. Here's one. My Life in Cricket. Well, that's certainly sports. Who's the author? Peter Adams. He also wrote Journeys Through Spain. Did he? Next one is Stephen Bow. He wrote Summer Barbecues, Cooking for Singles, Dinners by Candlelight. Anything else? No. Do you have anything by Pam Campbell? Wanderings in Greece, My Life in Russia, Travels in the Amazon, and Pam Campbell's Guide to a Successful Trip. Oh, sounds like she got around. My next one is C. Ketsik. He has a list of books about football, the World Cup, Heroes of the World Cup, Playing with the Round Ball, Soccer for Everyone. That's enough. He was a one-topic writer. Ari Hussain, however, wrote about cooking and travel. His series of cookbooks is called Living and Cooking in Spain, Living and Cooking in China, Living and Cooking in Brazil. He's been everywhere. I've got a specialist here, Sally Innes on tennis. Here are some of her titles. Improve Your Serve, Tennis for Everyone, Tennis Forever. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. 
Sally Innes on tennis. Here are some of her titles. Improve Your Serve, Tennis for Everyone, Tennis Forever. Meg Jorgensen has three books, one in each category. Cooking for Health, Sport is Good for You and Travelling in Australia. A varied talent. Who's next? Bruno Murray. He wrote children's books. A whole series called The Child's Guide to and then The Name of the City. Oh, you mean like A Child's Guide to London? Yes, that's right. He seems to have stayed in Europe. Ruby Lee, however, has just one book. It's called The Emerald Isle, and it's all about Ireland. Apparently she went around Ireland on foot. Jim Wells wouldn't like that. His books are all about motor racing. Hmm, nice photos of old racing cars. Don't you love the goggles on the driver? They do look strange, don't they? I think we're nearly finished. What did Helen Young write? Summer menus. Food for thought. She also did a book of Chinese recipes. Cantonese, I think. OK. That's dealt with the first box. Let's stop for a minute. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between three students, David, Joseph, and Carrie. In the first part of the discussion, they will be talking about lounges in different school buildings on campus. First look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 24. Hey, Joseph. Long time no see. How's it going? Oh, hey, David. It's going fine. I'm a little overwhelmed with all these new courses, but I'm hanging in there. Have you met my girlfriend, Carrie? No. Hi, Carrie. Hi, David. Joseph told me about you. You two had quite the time last semester in European history, I hear. Yeah, we like to hang out after class. Now it's a little harder, though. Lounges aren't as good as they were back there in Wilson Hall. Yeah, they had chairs, couches and tables to put your stuff on. And that lounge was full. There must have been 25 seats in there. Really? The lounge in Jones Hall, where I have my communications course, only has about ten chairs. It's awful. We all just stand around or leave. I wish we could hang out more. Well, Agriculture Hall is next door. Their lounge is on the first floor, and it has couches. I think there are about six of them, and they're comfortable and hardly used at all. That's not a good idea. Thanks. But don't go to lounge at Skidmore Hall. I don't even know why they call it a lounge. It's just four chairs in the corner of the main walkway. In the second part of the discussion, David, Joseph and Carrie continue talking about conducting a survey. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30.
Guys, we should really do something about those lounges. I mean, couldn't we gather signatures and try to get the university to improve some of the facilities? Yeah, that's a great idea. But we can't just say something random like, oh, you need to make the buildings nicer. We should come up with some kind of ranking system and have students rank buildings, how beautiful they are, how nice they are, etc. Well, if we were ranking on a scale of one to three, you all know that I would rank Skidmore Hall a one. Like I just said, that place is awful. No facilities. The bathrooms are way down in the basement. You're right. But they do have a nice balcony on the third floor. That might increase its value. But you shouldn't rank the architecture. You should rank how nice the building is, for students to hang out in. Oh, OK. Then I agree with you. So should we do this? I think it's a great idea. But let's try it ourselves on a couple buildings so that we can work out any bugs in it. I think Wilson Hall is the best. Sure, but we've already begun. We will give a building one point if it has poor facilities, not enough chairs and no vending machines, that kind of thing. And give a building two points if it is OK or acceptable. We can rank buildings that we really like as having three points. So like Joseph said, I think Wilson Hall is the best. It should have three points for sure. And Skidmore has a one. Now what other buildings should we rank? How about Merris Hall? No, they're not done with that one yet. But it looks like that will be a good place to hang out. How about Agriculture Hall? You said something about that hall a bit earlier. Oh yeah. They have that lounge with couches that no one uses. But that might indicate that people don't hang out there for other reasons. They don't have any drink machines. That's why I never go there. Oh, well, then I think it's an average building. Let's give it the middle ranking. I agree. It could be improved slightly, but it's got a couple of nice features. I like that lounge in that third floor, for example, but the stairs are too short. I always trip when I'm walking up them. This ranking is getting complex. OK, one building we haven't talked about is Canton Hall. What do you guys think of Canton? Is that next to the law building? Yep. It's got this excellent connecting corridor with chairs and desks to relax and work at. The cafeteria there is great too. I think that place is just as good as Wilson. Well, I've only been there once and didn't know that was what it was called. It was kind of confusing and it's kind of far for me to go. But I liked it. So I'll give it the middle ranking. Two points because it had nice facilities, but a poor and confusing layout. Oh, Joseph, you like Canton Hall? I hate that place. It's so mechanical, cold and impersonal. The furniture is nice, sure, but it's the last place on campus I would go to. I give it a one. Interesting. Well, let's write this little survey up and start passing it around. I don't have time to type it up. Can you? Sure. I'll do it after my biology class. Should we meet up at Wilson tonight around 8? Sure. No problem. We'll see you then. That is the end of part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Listen to an interview. Mr. Brooks, Mark, Jean and Robert are being interviewed on the subject of friendship. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I consider friendship to be one of the most important things in life, whatever your status, married or single. I see too many lonely people around. A lot of us get so involved with material values, family problems, keeping up with the Joneses, etc., that we forget the real meaning of friendship. Which is what, according to you? They say a friend in need is a friend indeed, which is partly true. But a real friend should also be able to share your happy moments without feeling jealous. A good friendship is one where you can accept and forgive him, understand mood, and don't feel hurt if a friend doesn't feel like seeing you. Of course, honesty is an essential part of any relationship. We should learn to accept our friends for what they are. As a married man, do you find your friendship is only with other men? Of course not. Both my wife and I have men and women friends, thank goodness. Although family life is fulfilling, it isn't enough. Both my wife and I get tremendous satisfaction from our friends, married or single, male and female. And we both have our separate friends too. We'd get bored with each other if we had the same friends. You must have a full life. We certainly do. And as I say, our friendship gives us a lot of pleasure. After all, friends should not be people with whom you kill time. Real friendship, in my opinion, is a spiritually developing experience. I've never had a lot of friends. I've never regarded them as particularly important. Perhaps that's because I come from a big family, two brothers and three sisters, and lots of cousins. And that's what's really important in my family. If you really need help, you get it from your family, don't you? Well, at least that's what I've always found. What about you, Jean? To me, friendship, having friends, people I know I can really count on. To me, that's the most important thing in life. It's more important even than love. If you love someone, you can always fall out of love again, and that can lead to a lot of hurt feelings, bitterness and so on. But a good friend is a friend for life. And what exactly do you mean by a friend? Well, I've already said, someone you know you can count on. I suppose what I really mean is, let's see, how am I going to put this? It's someone who will help you if you need help, who will listen to you when you talk about your problems, someone you can trust. What do you mean by a friend, Robert? Who likes the same things that you do? Who you can argue with and not lose your temper, even if you don't always agree about things. I mean, someone who you don't have to talk to all the time, but can be silent with, perhaps. That's important, too. You can just sit together and not say very much sometimes. Just relax. I don't like people who talk all the time. Are you very good at keeping in touch with your friends if you don't see them regularly? No, not always. I've lived in lots of places, and, to be honest, once I move away, I often do drift out of touch with my friends. And I'm not a very good letter writer either. Never have been. But... I know that if I saw those friends again, if I ever moved back to the same place, or for some other reasons, we got back into close contact again, I'm sure the friendship would be just as strong as it was before. Several of my friends have moved away, got married, things like that. One of my friends has had a baby recently, and I'll admit... I don't see or hear from her as much as I used to. She lives in another neighbourhood, and when I phone her, she always seems busy. But that's an exception. I write a lot of letters to my friends, and get a lot of letters from them. I have a friend I went to school with, and ten years ago she emigrated to Canada. But she still writes to me every month, and I write to her just as often. That is the end of part four. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers.